Hello everybody and welcome to Cabaret Secrets. My name is Gary Williams. Today's guest is a genuine YouTube sensation. Her version of Total Eclipse of the Heart, where she impersonates 19 different singers, has received almost 6.5 million views. She's appeared on The Ellen DeGeneres Show and Paul O'Grady. She starred in Forbidden Broadway and recently made her Edinburgh Fringe debut. Time Out New York said she's a comic firecracker with a pyrotechnic voice who drives the audience wild. Christina Bianca, welcome to Cabaret Secrets. No, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Tell me, how long did it take you to become an overnight success? <laughs> a very long time. No, I've been, I've been performing my whole life. I started um, in theatre, you know, community, regional theatre, whatever I could get into around age six or seven. And uh, started working really? in, yeah, in addition for, you know, paying regional theater jobs as I got older. I grew up just outside of New York City, so there were a lot of opportunities. And I also auditioned for a lot of Broadway shows and all that uh, as a child. So I got in very, very early to the whole theater music scene. So you were a, a child actress? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and with that, all the all the fun of the auditions and the rejection and the classes and the... Uh, my, my poor parents were basically chauffeurs driving me from school <laughs> to a, a dance class or a voice lesson, then to a rehearsal for a show and back again, you know, eating uh, dinner were, in the were car. They, were they pushy parents or, you know, were they sort of going along with your ride or...? Um, I was really... I am still really lucky to have such supportive parents. Um, both my parents are, are very musical. Didn't really do much with it. My mother was in a band and I mean, she can still sight read and play the piano far better than I ever ca could. <laughs> but um, they... From a very young age, they heard me singing. I mean, I was apparently, according to them, I was singing before I could speak, just phonetically. I would sing along, <laughs> and uh, they knew that that I that I needed to have it as an outlet, at least. It's not a whole career that I needed to at least. And they wanted to encourage it, mm -hmm. so I could um, grow, and it was made me so happy. And so they put me in 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 classes that they could from a young age, piano lessons, and as I said, you know, any opportunity for children's theater. There it seems to be a lot more now than there was w when I had growing up. Right. And so I'm a little jealous of that when I see all these kids now, and they have such great um, even television shows like Glee and all the High School Musicals. We didn't have that. We did have, however, the classics and the the musicals and the movie musicals, you know, Mary Poppins and The Sound of Music and Wizard of Oz, and th that was my schooling at first. Did you go to sort of musical theatre school or, or just classes? Yeah. No, I, I, I ended up going to uh, NYU, Tisch School of the Arts, and uh, some people always ask me why I did that, because I was sort of working in the business at that point. I had my, you know, equity points and all that stuff. Um, and it's quite true, and this is no, no offence to NYU, it's quite true, I probably could have taken taken the most expensive classes in singing, acting, dancing, voice and speech, um, you know, movement, whatever, in New York City. And it still would have cost less than <laughs> going to NYU. But I wanted the degree, and I also wanted um, just the experience, the college experience. And, um, and presumably you learned was. something. It's one thing getting the work, but presumably you learned new skills as yeah, well, right? Yeah, I certainly did. I had some wonderful teachers and I had some teachers that I, I didn't love, but that's part of it because you, in, I do believe that's part of it. In our profession, you're going to work with people that, that change your life and you want to work with them again and again and then very often you're forced to work with people that maybe you don't see eye to eye with, but you still have to do it, you know? <laughs> you do, you have to do it. You have to find a way to work with it. So a lot of kids in, in school, I, I had a little bit of an upper hand because I had been performing and from New York, it sort of nothing threw me. I was sort of prepared for it. But a lot of the kids going to NYU for the first time, you know, hitting the, the Big Apple, they dealing with a lot of these really abrasive teachers, and and they were sort of sort of scared. And I was a little more tough. And I thought, yeah, I'll deal with this. I'll be next semester. I won't have this person anymore. So, but it was very helpful. The good and the bad. I'm not trying to say it was all bad. I had so many wonderful teachers and wonderful experiences there. But um, I just wanted the variety. The, the good and the bad of it, and uh, as far as academically, I went to the musical theater program um, at the Tisch School of the Arts, but I really, um, there was a musical theater program in the School of Education, and that focused more on the music. Well, I was always a singer first. That's what I always considered myself, a singer first, so I thought, no, I don't want that. I feel pretty confident with that. I want to go where there's more emphasis on the acting and the dance and the stuff that I want to work on more. And I wanted to go to um, RADA, the classical program at RADA. And I had a choice. I had a choice to, to go to RADA 
which was like a little longer amount of time and a little more money, or if I doubled up and went to summer school courses, I could have double majored in journalism. And I chose that. <laughs> so I have a degree that is sort of pointless to have, impossible work to get. I have a journalism Maybe degree. one day. But it's Maybe one me. day. It's helped me um, just as a writer and, and seeing things um, when I'm creating my own material. It's always helpful to sort of, you know, go back and look at, okay, so how would this lay out? How does this read? How does this play? How does mm. this work? So I don't regret my decision at all. <laughs> when did the impressions start? Um, impressions started technically that I was aware that I will start doing impressions, here we go, only six years ago. But my parents tell me that I was doing voices from a very young age. They wouldn't call them impressions because I wouldn't. I, I always had a good ear. And so... I always say this, so forgive me if you've heard me say this before, but I grew up with a house just full, filled with music. My, my mother was musical, my father worked in radio, so they were, every corner of the house was filled with cassettes and records and CDs of different genres of music. And when I would sing along, I would always sort of take on the tone of the style or whoever was singing. And not to pat myself on the back, but that's one of the reasons I think I've been able to work a lot. I never had a job waiting tables. I never had a temp job. I always sang. If it wasn't theater, I was still singing. I was but were you taking on these band. voices because uh, you were, it was almost by accident? That was it. That was it. When I was young, it was completely by accident. And I, I would never have taken it to the point where someone would say that was a full-on impression. But if I was singing, I don't know how to, how to describe it. So if you're listening to, you know, Bernadette Peters sing a Broadway show tune or even Annie and Annie, it's more nasal and forward and, mm. and that way. But if I was listening to Reba McIntyre singing country music, it was in the back of my throat and very laid back. and very. So uh, the tone of the, the genre was the first, it sort of was the first thing to inform me about the what I was listening to and how to, get it in my throat but it was just just by accident that I started to get these impressions and the first impression I ever truly remember doing and getting a response and thinking oh oh I guess I can sort of do an impression of that person was Celine Dion and I was in oh my gosh probably probably my last year of high school college and I uh, was singing along to her singing the song that's the way it is or as Celine says that's the way it is and I just was making, sort of making fun of because I love her, but how she, her pronunciation is so ridiculous, and I was sort of doing that, and everybody was cracking up at this party, and I thought, oh, okay, I thought that, so I have a party trick. That's all I thought. Because um, there's a big difference between from doing it for fun, for yourself, for your yeah. friends, and then doing it where, you know, you're presenting yourself as I do impersonations. I mean, did you really then go away and work hard? No, it wasn't. I'm really serious. I'm I really, love that. No. No, I mean, I have to tell you, I did when, okay, six years ago, um, I won't give you my life story, but I will tell you that eventually I didn't care as much about theater because I was singing and creating my own work and just so happy to be working and not being told I was too short or too that not this type or that mm -hmm. type um, but my, one of my all-time favorite um, shows to see growing up was Forbidden Broadway and one of the reasons I loved it was because the, the people on that show were so versatile they could sing a million different styles in one night so I always loved that show and um, just when I sort of sworn off theater for a while I saw an ad in Backstage magazine in New York with all the audition notices for Forbidden Broadway and I was out of college. I had just done Dora the Explorer live national tour. Very glamorous. It was actually pretty great, but it was still a children's show. And I, uh, I looked at you know what I wanted to do, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm an adult now. I'm a working actor, and I think I could actually audition for this and be right for this, and it wouldn't be embarrassing. I can change my voice a little bit. So, um, okay, who's on Broadway right now? Get, let's get to work on this. And that, I really... Just to prepare for the audition. Just to prepare for the Forbidden Broadway audition, I locked myself in my home, and I worked on Bernadette Peters and Kristen Chenoweth at the time, Kelly O'Hara, um, old classics like Julie Andrews and people I knew that Forbidden Broadway had spoofed in the past, like Patti Lapone and Judy Garland and Liza Minnelli. And I, I thought about current people, and the Broadway actress Carrie Butler was doing a lot. I thought, I think. So I just made a list, a little post it note, and I practiced and practiced. And I'm telling you, the most telling thing I ever did was I called my parents and I said, Who does this sound like? And I did about six, and I can't, I can't, we'll never forget my mom being like, This sounds like Bernadette 
years. I didn't know you could do this. Joe, did you know she could do this? I mean, we always knew you could do voices, but that's really good. Yeah. That's really good. They just... I thought it was good. We spend all this money and this is all you can do. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm sure a little bit of that too, but, but that was it. I mean, they knew, I think we all knew in my family that I was very good at ch- changing my voice for style, stylistically. But to actually apply it and say, this is an impression, mm. was, was different. And then, uh, thankfully, I was good at it, and I was able to get a lot of nuance. Um, As I was, was doing the show eight times a week, however many times, yeah. you were able to really perfect it, these, oh, these voices. Oh, yeah, when I started, and I give you more I confidence, rubbish. I suppose. Absolutely. I listened to the Forbidden Broadway uh, soundtrack that I was on. We recorded that so early. I barely knew how I was doing the numbers. I barely knew the lines. My impressions were rubbish. And I hear it now and I think, oh no, it's not good. I don't want anybody to hear that. I do it so differently now. But that's the blessing of doing uh, a show eight shows a week. And, and let me tell you, when I auditioned, I just thought, I'll do my best. And mm. I never thought I'd get the part. And let me tell you, when somebody casts you for doing impressions, you learn really quickly. Yeah. You get confident really quickly because you have to. Mm. You had to be in front of people. And uh, that's something that really... Um, I guess hit me. You have to do it as if you're completely confident about it. Yeah, this isn't, just, no, this isn't just for no fun No time. Material goes, also goes into that show. Material can change in a dime depending on what happened in, in theater that week. Yeah. So impressions would come and go in a heartbeat. They'd have changed. You'd have a favorite line that you say, oh, I can really get the person's tone on this line. Next night, it's completely rewritten. Great training ground, though. It's amazing. There's nothing like it. It's it's such good boot camp for I think every other sort of yeah, um, yeah. every th- uh, theatrical experience. But the, the, I love the big it. Uh, your big YouTube hit, which was only recorded, I think you put it on a couple of years ago or something. The total eclipse of the heart was that yeah, last, last year? August, just last August. Yeah, back, over just, six just and a half o- million views, just over a year. Was that a big shock to you? I mean, it must have been huge shock. I mean, it, really? I mean, you can, so tell me honestly. I mean, oh did my you, God, no, if there. There's nothing I can say to make people believe me, and this is the honest to goodness truth. I clicked a button. I put stuff on the internet for fun. And it was you just that. You just thought, well, let's record this bit of shtick because it's in, was it in 54 terrible. below yeah, that Yeah, and let's be honest, it is terrible quality. I mean, trust me, the YouTube comments alone will show you. People are like, I can't hear her. This is so stupid. Tell the crowd to shut up. Well, listen, it wasn't meant to be well, this part of the fantastic of it, piece it? Of, of film. My friend was shooting it over, my sh- over somebody's head because... I wanted to just have a record of it to see how it went. And how did it, did it, did, it, did, you, did you put it up there and, you know, it was 100, 200, 300, and then it went ballistic, yeah. or did it go, I mean, how quickly did that mount this up? Was, this was funny. I, I could tell really quickly that something was different about this one. I, I posted a few videos, mm, I'd say that eight months before that, that were getting some views, and I thought, who is watching this? And typically it was Forbidden Broadway musical fans. Like a few thousand? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and one of my videos went what they call semi-viral, mm. and uh, it's me singing Katy Perry's "Firework" in lots of costumes and mm. whatever. And some UK um, radio stations picked it up, and I actually did something for Capital FM, mm-hmm. Capital Breakfast, on that. And I thought, oh, there's a market for this. Mm. So for the, that, the only reason I'm mentioning this is because I thought people are actually watching this. I didn't think they were, and I should make it easier for them to do so. After that, I made a YouTube channel. Right. I only had about 10 videos on it, and only mm. like three of them were impressions, but I, at least I put something out there. That helped, mm. because then it sort of linked up to your Facebook and your Twitter mm. and your stuff. Mm. So um, when I put up the Total Eclipse video, and trust me, I put up so many more videos before that that mm. nobody watched. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's just the way it works. But randomly, that one took off, and the reason I could tell it was different so quickly is because my phone was blowing up in all of my areas, in Twitter, on Facebook, on but, my uh, YouTube. What, I was getting subscribers to my YouTube channel I know suddenly. that you got, uh, obviously, you, you, you got some TV exposure, I guess, from the success of that, but I'm interested that, that was all that purely, that, that, that those hits on on YouTube, they just mounted up in a, was it like an organic way, or was there, you know, you got a few thousand, then you got some, I don't know, a TV appearance, no. and everybody suddenly, it was just this sort of, really, a, a true viral video. Absolutely, but, but both of the viral videos that I've had, the Total Eclipse and the Let It Go, are completely natural, and, uh, and I can tell you this, because people always try to pitch you and email you saying they can help you make it bigger or do this, or if you do this, yeah, we'll course. pitch this, and... Um, some, some people might do that. It might be great for some people. It wasn't for me. Um, no, the, the Total Eclipse video had 2 million views in under, f- like, three days. Wow. I think that was it. Wow. Maybe it was four days. I think it was under three days. And, that um, sounds viral. And right after that, 
I thought it would sort of subside, and it didn't. It grew naturally mm. to four million. After I think after I performed, that was the video came out in August. September, the end of September, I was on the Ellen DeGeneres show. Because so of the had, video. Yeah, that, so that it, the video had already attention. been out over a month by the time I performed, and it had over 4 million views by the time I was on Ellen. So then, since then, now, in the past year, it has only gone up, only, <laughs> another, yeah. like, two, two and a half million. Yeah, small but, that, but that's how it works. So you get the surge. Yeah. Um, but, but then the other side of it is my performance on the Ellen DeGeneres show, that video, I don't own that video, it's not on my channel, yeah. that video has 4 million hits. Yeah. Because she's so popular. So it's not like it necessarily led to them clicking on my video. They just watched that appearance. And do you think those that kind of exposure, that kind of interest, does it relate, translate, I should say, to people coming to see you perform uh, live? Has it given you marquee value? Yes. Um, this is what was so shocking to me. Um, I don't know that the Ellen appearance could have done anything but help me because she's so popular, immensely popular. But... Um, and this is not an insult, I'm just saying, on her show, I was put on the show as, like, the YouTube sensation of the week or the month or whatever. Yeah. So I wasn't billed as a professional artist who had her own show. And that was a little weird for me just because I'm not an overnight sensation. Well, with YouTube, I am an overnight yeah, sensation, yeah, yeah. but I have a show. Like, I have actually but they don't want to. But they don't want to sounds talk about better that. to say, wow, you're right. just this girl. Because and... it's so funny. It's, it's like, you know, but you still haven't heard of me, and I certainly have no, aren't known for, am not known for doing impressions and doing this song, but yet it was still, you don't want to talk about that stuff. So that, it didn't help me in, in that regard. It wasn't like people watched that and said, oh, she's a wonderful actress. Let's give her work, mm. or let's... Um, Go see I mean, you were, perform well, you were performing in Forbidden Broadway at the time. No, I was performing in a show called Musical at Okay, the time. so did, yeah, yeah. did numbers surge after that? Did you see, you know, were people is, giving you their cash? I think the producer's going to be angry, uh, was angry about this, because the truth is, I had, I was working, I had asked for a leave of absence for about a month to go do some symphony gigs and do some of my own solo shows. So musical did not reap the benefits of it, but I did. And I can tell you, that, so I'm babbling, my gosh, just reliving all this. But the, um, the true answer is not only did it give me followers on the internet, but the shocking thing to me is that people then clicked a button to go to my website, clicked a button to see where I was playing, clicked a button and pulled out a credit card to buy tickets. And the great thing is with the net, you can, you can see that, can't yeah. you can trace that back. And I never thought that was possible. And, and the real killer is I happened just on a whim, you know, to have a contact with um, this lovely, talented man named Ian Stroyer, who said that he thought I would do very well in London and I should play the Hippodrome. And he said, I know you don't think anybody will come, but, you know, we'll, we'll just have some fun. If people don't come, we'll cancel the second show and we'll just sort of get you over here and introduce you to some people. And I thought this would be a great idea. To you were friends anyway or he just kind of got He reached out to me on the Internet. Right. I think we had some mutual friends via Facebook, but, no, right. he reached out to me uh, more as a, a business offer than a... Uh, just uh, uh, someone who knew the venue, was working at the venue, and saw an we opportunity. We should mention Ian's alter ego. Ian's alter ego is Vel Michelli, who I'm currently working with here. In a everywhere. fearsome drag queen. Fierce is absolutely right. And fabulous. Yes, in every way. Um, but at the time, I just knew him as very handsome Ian. And Ian said, um, you should come with these shows. And I was very scared nobody would come. Cut. My shows are, I think, September 8th, 9th, and 10th that year, so something like that. This is what, last year? Last year, last September. And my Total Eclipse video went viral on August 11th or oh, August perfect 14th. Perfect timing. And all of my shows sold out. They added two more, and they sold out. So do you, do you already? Or could I, you it, was before, it was before I was on Ellen, I'd like to say. That was just the video. Right. So could, you, could you see yourself, uh, or are you already resenting the label of, you know, YouTube sensation impersonator? I was really worried about that. Um, but no, the answer is no. And I, I have to say that's because it sounds so cheesy, but because my followers and my fans, the majority of them, like what I do as a whole. They have come to see my live shows and they know that I don't just do impressions and they appreciate that I don't just do impressions and they like the songs that are in my own voice. They like getting to know me. They like that I have other ways of entertaining them and they appreciate that. So I don't feel like a one-trick pony. Mm. They're not forcing me to just do the one thing. It does get difficult when I want to post YouTube videos because some people want the exact same thing. Do what you did before. But if I do what I did before, 
they're going to get tired of it very quickly. It's going to get old very quickly. So um, I'm trying to embrace the YouTube uh, sensation title. It's like a, a, a singer that has a big hit and then they spend the rest of their career trying to leave that hit and never do it live. It, yeah. it's, it's sort of the, it's what gave them the success, but it ends up being, uh, being uh, dragging them down yeah. also as well. Yeah. I'm very reluctant to do Total Eclipse of the Heart anymore because I'm, not only have I done it on the internet, I did it on Ellen and I did it on the Paul O'Grady show. So now, it, that, that's it. I mean, but people I, still want to hear it, I guess. They do. So, but the, the, the good thing for me is that I had another video go viral this year, which is the Let It Go video, which is a little more recent. So I choose my battles. At the end of the show, I can pick one of those to, yeah, <laughs> to yeah, do. Yeah. Um, but it, you, and again, you find other ways of doing it. You can give a little snippet of it without doing the whole song. I certainly don't want to. I certainly want to make my fans happy. Yeah, your collaboration with uh, Ian ended up becoming Devolution, yeah. which you're doing at the Edinburgh Fringe. Yeah. And that show came together pretty quickly. It did. You know, I was, uh, I, as I've just said, I had a very successful run of my show at the Hippodrome, a show that I put together called Diva Moments. I'd done it in the U.S., uh, at Birdland, in some regional theaters, in the West Coast, and on luxury cruise lines. And it's it's been such a great um show for me and I really wanted to tour it here in the UK I still do and I'm looking to, to do that we're moving to do that but I wasn't sure if doing a run you know 20 something shows in 20 something days at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival was right for that show why? Uh, cutting the show to an hour is difficult uh, and to get everything in would be difficult um, to have the musicians that I wanted would be difficult and more expensive and I just wasn't sure it was the right Time. It sounds silly, but also because I'd done the show so successfully in London, you sort of, most people do that after Edinburgh. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So I wasn't sure that it was the right thing to bring, but I wanted to do something. I'd always wanted to perform here. Um, and also, I should say vocally, yes, it would have been doing it eight shows a week, I could probably do, but 22 shows in a row without a day off, I don't think I could have done. And that's what my schedule had to be. So I was just talking about it and thinking about it, and um, Ian was talking about how he always wanted to do The Fringe. And um, he decided, because he's a go-getter, to sort of make some calls and see what would what, what interest would be or whatever. And there were a few uh, people that expressed interest in possibly producing uh, one or both of us, and um, because I don't know many people here in the mm -hmm. UK, so he was been really great in opening some doors for me, and it just worked out perfectly. Mm -hmm. That uh, we just we just thought, you know, if we could join forces sort of and did something together, we'd be able to have a bit of fun, do a bit of what each of us do, and give a taste of our shows. While so we're getting to promote our own shows, but while doing something that's totally collaborative. We, we, wanted, we didn't want it to be a tag team show, like first you sing and then I mm -hmm. sing and then, you know, we wanted it to be more I was surprised that. what a collaboration it was. I was expecting, because I'd heard about you and mm -hmm. I was expecting to see you with, what, I didn't know what else, something else. I didn't mm -hmm. know who this Velmocelli character was. But it really is a, a two-hander, isn't it? It's a, it's a true collaboration and, and the better for it, I think. Yeah, well, you know, the, the, the other thing is when you have your own show and you have a lot of time and you have, you know, a room with perfect sound and sound is a big thing for me with the impressions and you just never know what you're going to get when you, when you come to various venues and it all just seems like we could really get the best of everything if we collaborated. It just seemed like we could work it out and feed off each other and... And um, I don't know. I think my uh, target audience is is quite broad. I mean, most people think it's just a bunch of <laughs> lovely musical theater boys just clicking my video. And I do believe that they're the people, the, the, the audience that propelled me and pushed me. But um, since appearing on the Paula Grady show, I have a lot of you know mums and grandparents and 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 a lot of uh, people that are a little. I want to say older, but just their tastes are a little more sophisticated, a little different. And so I didn't. I knew I couldn't do a show that was just going to appeal to the teeny boppers that were watching on YouTube and wanted me to do a Britney Spears and Katy Perry impression. I had to do something that was also going to appeal to the people that wanted to hear Shirley Bassey and Judy Garland. Now that's what I do on my solo shows, but I'm given enough time where I really get to cover all of that. And so here, 60 minutes is really hard. And it is even harder when you split it, with, but split it up between two people. But Velma, as a being, 
provide something in the show that the nine didn't have to do. And then I provided something that Belmont didn't have to do. We sort of shared the wealth. You seem to be very happy to share the stage time with each other. Yeah, well, you know, I think that Ian is an incredibly talented performer. And um, thankfully, he thinks the same about me. And so there's no competition between us. I mean, not only are we a man and a woman, or, or a woman and a man in drag, um, but we're... The size thing's great, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, the height huge differences. In, in your it's, time. it's just comedy. I mean, how yeah. could you not want to work together? I love the fact that you didn't refer to the size. You did. It was all the better for you not trying to milk that. That was a conscious decision. Um, my whole life, everyone is always telling me how short I am, mm. so it's... Trust me, I know. So I, <laughs> I figured this time that we would sort of leave it alone. And it is. It's great. It's a great visual. I mean, I feel like I'm not doing a good job of explaining sort of why we decided to do it. But, it, you know, you want to be creative. And we appreciated each other's uh, talent. And we had a lot of the same ideas. So we both wanted to come here. And we just thought, I think it'd be great if we, we combined forces. And when we did... We were then able to get uh, a venue we really wanted at a great time, mm, and I think mm. everybody got excited about the collaboration. Mm. Because it's, let's face it, it was, as performers, we're often, uh, you know, we have egos and we sort of we have our own idea about how we want to do a show and how we want to present ourselves, and it, it can be difficult to let go of that. Yeah, it can, it can, but that's a lovely thing, and I, the lovely thing about working with with Ian and also our music director uh, Joe Joe Louis Robinson. Um, is we're a good team, you know. We, yeah. we know Joe has worked with Ian for a very long time, so they know each other inside and out. And when I came to London, Ian hooked me up with Joe to be my MD at the Hippodrome, and then he just played for me again at Royal Albert Hall's Elgar Room. So there's a familiarity with each other, and we sort of know each other's bits and what goes well together. You're listening to Christina Bianco with me, Gary Williams, on the Cabaret Secrets podcast. In the next edition, we'll be talking technical on how Christina creates her shows, and we'll get a sneak peek into Party for One, her new show set to debut in London this September. Christina, I know soon you're going to be in Forbidden Broadway in London at the Chocolate yeah. Factory, which is very exciting. Everything's come full circle. <laughs> yeah, right. And after that, you are, are you, you're working on a new show of your own? As before that, yes. I'm working on a, a, a brand new show. I figured a, to come back to the Hippodrome a year after I played with a brand new show would be Now, perfect. when you're putting a, a, a new show together... It's, I mean, you're on stage, what, two, 45, 50 minute uh, yeah. uh, halves. Um, that's a lot of stage time. Yes, <laughs> how do you try, I mean, how do you um, create the shape? And Because that was something that really impressed me about the show here in Edinburgh. It had a great shape and it, we were constantly being hit by something new. Uh, that we were, our, our attention could never waver. You never let us go. Uh, when you're, do you, know, do you try and do that when you're putting your own show together and, and is it, you know, how important is the chat, the patter in your show? Um, for, yes, I definitely try to, to have um, a variety in my shows but also with a flow. You know, if you're not doing a scripted show that has a through line or an arc, you have to make an arc anyway. You mm. have to make some sort of, I mean, the, the flow and the pacing of a show is more important than the material because if you have amazing numbers, but they're put together in a lousy order and not segued, the segues aren't proper or appropriate, then you might as well not do them, in my opinion. Then it's just somebody standing and singing pretty. And that's lovely for a concert, but not for a, a show, not for a, a true cabaret. Um, and I for, used to worry that I did too much patter and people just wanted to hear the singing. Um, but I've outgrown that <laughs> theory now because uh, the audience likes to get to know you. Mm. And the more that the audience knows you, then I think the more they appreciate your songs and how your, your acting choices and how you open up to them and, and all that. And again, you can piece together some really great shows and some really great stories that wouldn't necessarily go together with, with the bridge of well done patter. Um, so I think it's it's really um, key. You start by scripting, like typing out your patter as a script. Where does how does it yeah, begin? I start with bullet points of a script. Right. I um, if I know the sort of music that I want, I usually don't know all the songs that I want to do in a show. I know a, I know a, a bunch. I'd like to do this. I'd like to do that. Now, do they all work together? How can they all work together? And then the patter comes after the songs, or is it at the same time? No, it's at the same time for me, because when I start a show, I know what the topic is, the theme. So my last show is D. So that's, that's what it starts yeah, with. Yeah, it the, starts the with an idea and a theme. Right. Um, 
because that's important to me to, to have a theme. So my, my last show was called Diva Moments, and it was about songs that made divas out of the women who sang them. Now you, I couldn't choose all the most cliche songs. It would be too easy. So it, then it became... Okay, so why do I think this is an important song choice for that woman? So then they're learning about the woman, and they're hearing the song, but they're also hearing my um, take on it, or why I think that's important, or why that particular particular moment means something to me. So they've already got something a little more well-rounded then. And then they sang this, and then they move on. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, this time, it's, a, it's actually a little bit different for me this time, because I have now, this will be my third time, I sound like... I'm not patting myself on the back too much, but I'm very grateful. It'll be my third time playing London to sold-out audiences. And I'm assuming it's the same audience, or mostly the same audience that's come. So they've seen my show at the Hippodrome, which was Deep Moments. They saw a, a different show, sort of in a more of an eclectic evening called Just an Evening with Christina Bianco at Royal Albert Hall's Elgo Room. So now I want to do something that's different. I want to present something that you know, gives them what they want, why, why I know they like to, to watch my shows and come back, but I want to give them something a little different that shows that I, I can, that shows a different side of me or opens up a different part of me. So because they know me now, I get to be a little more, not self-indulgent, but make the show more about me. So this show is particularly about myself. Now, I'm not going to sit on a stool and tell you, and I was 16, I had this experience. It's not that, not that sort of you know, personal storytelling. But um, it'll, it gives me the familiarity with the audience now, gives me a freedom I've never had before in cabaret, which is that they know a lot of what I do. And they, you don't have to explain yourself. I don't yourself. have to explain myself. So I can take time. I have uh, two lists of patterns. I have the bullet point version, which is the main, say this, say this, say this. Then I have the really wordy version, which then has to get cut down because it's too long. Right, so you start off with your bullet points, and then you will type out yeah. a full script. Is that, I mean, I don't want to I'll put words into that, but you, no, you'll, you'll type correct. out a full script, punctuation and everything, as if yes, it was a script I, that somebody else was, that, that, that you would be presented with and somebody was able to learn this. Yeah, yeah, of course, but... Uh, some of the things are written in ways that I know how I'm going to say it, so it yeah. would read quite odd, but yes, that's and exactly what I do. And then you, what, you could sort of work on that and start to cut it down, edit mm -hmm. it, get the time And I right. have to do it out loud. I have to get it on its feet. Yeah, I can't do it same. in front of an audience, but I have to just sit in a room and, and run the show yeah. and go from number to number and do the patter because there's nothing, there's nothing like actually saying it out loud. It can read fine, but it can sound very different when you say it out loud. You must be quite good at imagining the audience there and imagining their ideal reactions to what you're doing as you're I practicing hope so. this. <laughs> I hope so. Because when you do it, you probably do it with, in the same kind of pacing, the same kind of timing. You probably say something and you'll wait for the laugh that you are yeah. imagining will be there. And that is that is absolutely right. That's absolutely true. And it's, like I said, this, this piece is going to be completely brand new. So it's not like I'm just adding something or adapting something from a previous piece. So it's a little nerve-wracking because... You know, like I said, the last time I went to the Hippodrome, I went with a show that had been quote-unquote tested. Mm. And this time it's brand new, so... <laughs> do you have a kind of framework that you work to? I, I think so. I think now I do because I, um, I find myself knowing what the... These are the options for the, the finale. This is the option for the mm. opening. And I, I typically know it, those first. And I think that's because of the, the framework. How do you like Maybe. to open a show? I like to open Peppy. Yeah. I like to open with something that's really me and it's really fun, not an impression uh, for me particularly. Um, uh, and it, 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 I don't know, I took, I took a in my show Diva Moments, I took a risk because it's a very specific song, but it was appropriate for the start of the show, for the energy level, and for the beginning of my story for the show. I opened that with Wherever He Ain't, which is sort of a weird way to start a show. It's very abrasive, mm. but it was the right the right tone and it fit that slot from what I wanted. I mean, do you like to start with something that generally start with something that everybody knows as oh here we go it's show time or do you like to start with something that makes them go oh and sort of lean forward a little bit and really listen? Okay so the answer should be number one but I like to <laughs> no, number <I> two. <laughs> <laughs> no most people start with and I've seen a lot of concerts Gosh, this is such an obscure reference, and I don't think anyone in the UK is going to get it. There's a country music artist named Martina McBride, and she has all these fabulous hits that everybody knows, and she never starts her show with one of those hits. She always starts it with a song 
that is, uh, you could tell, probably one of her favorites. That is a good, you know, good driving song, not too overly dramatic to start, but just, just right there. And uh, just on that line, I like to say, that welcoming line, but still you're in for something a little, a little edgy tonight. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had a favorite song of hers, and I thought, if I was her, I'd start the show with this song. And I sat down in her concert, and she started the show with that song. And I compare every song I choose now to start a show with that. It's a song called It's My Time, Martina McBride. Um, and, and I think about what's the It's My Time for me. <laughs> so that's the actual dorky truth of how yeah, I figure great, it out. That's great. Um, a friend of mine, um, Alan Stewart, calls himself the King of the Vamps, but I, I, I think I'm King of the Vamps. Oh, so yeah? I have very little time in my show where I'm talking without any happening, without any underscore. Uh, there was a lot of underscore, a lot of things happening during your show that yeah. we saw. Um, is that something you're aware of? Do you like to kind of keep it going like that, or do you like no music? Uh, I, I think it's... I choose very specific times to have underscore while I'm talking and when I don't. Mm. Very specific times. If I'm telling a story, I don't like underscore. Mm. If I'm... That's interesting because most people yeah. start going into say, oh, you know, many years ago, or I was, a, you know, so and so was a big influence yeah. on me, and they have a little tinkly piano. It sets a little mood. I, you don't I, like that. I've never, I've never enjoyed that. Maybe, maybe, and this, this is just my opinion. Maybe because I've seen it done to a cliche, where it's, and then when I was a little girl, you know, I just, I just don't <laughs> do that anymore. But um, no, I like to do it um, when, when it's, when it's more about the song that I'm singing. Mm. Leading up to the song that I'm singing, because if I'm, if I'm ha- to me, if it's a separate moment, if I'm having a, a moment, if the accompanist is is working with you well and you can connect everything, that's great. Um, but I, I found because I do talk a lot too, I don't want the underscore to go on for 20 hours. Yeah, right. yeah. So I just try to when it's a little more succinct and I know exactly what I'm going to go into it, and it's more of a se- then it seems like more of a segue, even though you're fully doing patter. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I definitely choose very specific moments to have an underscore and not to have it. I notice when I analyse other people's shows, the build towards the end, there tends to be, I say, big, bigger, biggest. There are three big numbers that right. lead up towards the end. And then for the encore, for the finale, the, the last number, they often have, people often have a big dramatic ballad. You can finish with a big happy clappy thing or something that's a, a very nice tender romantic moment. Mm-hmm. Most people tend to go with the big my heart will go on kind right. of big rousing ballad. Right. What about you? It depends. I've been uh, and this is not using the word negatively but I've been forced to use an encore that's been one of my viral videos the past few times because typically it, the, one of those songs did not fit into the arc of my show. So then they've been patient and they've waited all night and They've enjoyed the show, but now let's give them the reason that they came in the first place. So I did that. At the Hippodrome, I did the Encore's Total Eclipse of the Heart. And the great thing about that particular number is it's, it's very long, of course, but it's ridiculous. I mean, it gives you the high, heightened drama, but it also sort of ends still, still ends soft and small. Mm. Um, and then uh, I chose a song somebody wrote for me. To the Royal Albert Hall one. It's sort of in between. That's nice, yeah, right. I don't. Um, so you don't. You don't sound too no, sort of locked I'm not, in. I'm not too really. locked in on it. I'm not too sold on it. I um, I to see to me because now I'm doing the impressions and I'm balancing that. That is a third layer. It's not just up tempo ballad pacing. It's what sort of impression do I? Uh, am I doing an impression? And then what sort of an impression? Is it a comedic impression number or is it an impression number where I do let's say. Um, Judy Garland and Barbara Streisand singing Happy Days Get Happy and I sing both parts well that's more of a ooh that was nice that's not funny people just sit back and enjoy that right. so I, it's a whole other um, genre of choices that I have to do it was interesting seeing you do uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow as yourself and Judy Garland in that even though you were doing the impression uh, nobody was laughing because right. it was a and beautiful they're not, moment. Hopefully they're not, they're not supposed to at that point. Hopefully it takes them back a little bit to watching Judy do it. And you would never have laughed at Judy when she did it, so why would you laugh at me doing it at that mm-hmm. point? So it's, I mean, they're welcome to, but that's not wasn't my intention, yeah. I've got to ask you, how do you take care of your voice? Because anybody that's listened to you sing, you do have a remarkable <laughs> instrument. I see you're yeah, reaching for I your herbal you. tea. <laughs> uh, I mean, you have an amazing voice. So, uh, I mean, and, and uh, doing a show like this in Edinburgh, 
what is it, 20-odd uh, consecutive yeah, shows? Yeah, tonight will be the 21st show in 21 days, yeah. Don't tell me that the first thing you do is not speak all day. If it is, I'm sorry that I've made no, you chat now I've for never, <laughs> I've never been that person that doesn't speak. I. Uh, there must be things you don't do, though. Well, it's easier for me to... T- <laughs> No. You're I not mean, smoking right now? I certainly don't smoke. I've never smoked, and I never will. I haven't seen you partying around anywhere since I've been no, here. I don't know. I have to be pretty good. Um, uh, enough doctors have told me that I have cords of steel, that I am very grateful for that, and I'd like to keep it that way. And that's, they've had, you had the camera down the oh, throat, yeah. and they've had a look. Actually, a while ago, about mm, eight months ago or so, I got really scared. I was doing more impressions than I'd ever been doing. I was doing more traveling than I'd ever been doing, and... Uh, I just felt like my voice was in a little bit of a rut. You I feel it was feeling uh, sore? It or? didn't feel sore. It wasn't a feeling. It, nothing felt injured. I just, when I sang, I thought it sounded different. Or I didn't have the uh, flexibility that I wanted. And I really couldn't tell if it was because I was traveling and then I was in sound systems that were so different from place to place that I never really could adjust. Or if this was me going through a problem. So I got scared and I went and I got the scope and the doctor pretty much laughed at me. He's like, you're chords are perfect you have nothing wrong (laughs) but that's but you need to check and you need to find out as a singer but particularly me doing these impressions I'm putting my chords through stuff that's not normal and isn't comfortable all the time I don't do impressions that really hurt me because that would be stupid I need to this is my livelihood so do you warm up I do warm up. I find warming up very important. I've not always been the best at it over the years. I'm, I've been known to uh, warm up through a show. If you know the show doesn't start, not my solo show, but let's say musical or something. <laughs> sort of like, well, the first couple songs are really easy, so I'll sort of pull them and warm up. Not good. Don't do that. And I don't do that anymore. No, I find you have to warm up. But even if you're doing 20-odd shows consecutively, you still warm up. Yeah. There's no sort of, well, I, I was just singing and my voice is, you know, I was just sang last night and I, my voice no. is... No, because Still every, day's, every day is different. I warm up all the time. For how long? I don't, how warm, long up, do you... I don't warm up the same length every day, depending on how my voice is. I mean, later today before the show, how long before the show will you warm up and for how long? It can be a few hours before. It can be, uh, if my show's at 7.30, I leave this house. I'm trying to think. Probably, I'll probably start warming up at 5.30. And, and for how long? However long until I feel like I'm pretty good, actually. Right. Many people have a strict regimen about it. I, I don't. There are a few warm-ups that I always start with and I always do, but I think it very much depends on my ability that day. I, it, I mean, if it's, if it's cold, if it's rainy, if I slept well, if I didn't, it's going to be easier or harder for me to sing. Some days I might have more grit in my voice. So a lot of people will do the same warm-up regardless of all those things. I don't. I'll figure it out. If I feel extra tired, then I'll warm up probably all in soprano, no belt warm-up at all, mm. and uh, maybe do less. Mm. Because if I'm already tired, the warming up might not, for, for my personal voice, warming up more might just tire it and not actually mm. stretch it and make it more warm. So it's... Uh, it's always tricky if you get a cold, isn't it? That you, 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 know, you, you need to rest your voice, but at the same time, you've got to sing, so yeah. you need to get it going a little bit. That's, that's a tough call, isn't it? It is a tough call, and it, it's, um, people always say, oh, sing above it. Well, Sopranos can sing above it, but if you're belting or doing impressions, it's quite difficult to sing above it, at least for me. Again, it's different for everybody. Um, so I've had to sing on, on lots of colds and stuffy noses and things, and it's unfortunate, but you, I tend to do the last-minute tricks. I love throat coat, the um, herbal tea. I um, have been known to use those big bad products that clear out the, the you know, nose, the sort of steroidy, afrony stuff. Mm. They're not good to use um, but they'll for get a you long duration, the but they'll get you through the show. If you can't breathe through your nose, you really can't sing at all. So <laughs> There's a lot to be said for just resting, isn't it? And lots of water. Yeah. Water is uh, the, the bane of my existence and the greatest thing in my life. Um, you need to drink water all the time. And now that I'm particularly I'm doing a lot of traveling, I find that I can really tell when I don't have enough water. I can tell when my voice is, is dry and when I'm dehydrated. So that's very key, very, very key for me. But, I mean, I'm pretty safe. I mean, I, I know that I put my voice through a lot more than what other people put their voice through. So after shows, even if I'm out after a show and not drinking or something and I'm just hanging out with friends, if the room is too loud, 
I, I go home. Yeah, it, you, 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 I have to. I find that's the worst thing for me. I, I can do a show and I'm, I'll feel fine. But I'll go out. I want to go out for a drink. You know, have a couple of beers after you the show. Chat to, yeah, you're, you're you want to wind down, right? Yeah. And you're talking. You're talking to friends. You're, you're in a noisy bar. You actually, you're kind of shouting this conversation. And, and I'll find I'll go home, thing. and it's, it is the worst, isn't it? To me, that's worse than anything else. It's worse than over singing. It's that shouting and hurting your voice without really realizing you're doing it. And you can't really tell it. until you get home or you wake up until the next it's morning. Too late. Yeah, and it's horrible, <laughs> right? And what about warming down? No, I don't do that. I mean, I'm sure lots of people do. I, like I said, I, I'm pretty pretty blessed. Um, if I don't warm up, I could probably sing fine, but I choose not to do that for my voice. Mm. I choose to be more careful. I never warmed down in my life. Um, but again, I don't get off the stage and chug a whiskey or something. I don't don't do that so mm. I think it's just a matter of um, calming yourself a little bit after a show yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean sometimes the you know you have all the adrenaline you have that rush and the excitement and if it's a solo show and you're meeting people afterwards and there's lots of um, attention from the audience it's it's exhausting it's a whole show mm. after a mm. show it is, yeah. so it, again it's just about getting rest and being boring and being an old lady like I've been here in Edinburgh and going yeah. to sleep early <laughs> you can have fun another time um, tell us the dates when we can come and see you uh, performing in London at Forbidden Broadway or your own show sure sure I'm at the Hippodrome in my show Party of One on September 5th 5th, 6th, and 7th. Has this sold out already? I think there might be a few tickets they're going to release, so check it out if you want to come. Yes, I'll get you a ticket for sure, Carrie. Um, And then um, my performances in the West End and Forbidden Broadway begin on September 9th, and they run through November 22nd. Thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to this Cabaret Secrets podcast. If you've got any comments or questions, please visit cabaretsecrets.com where you'll also find details of the Cabaret Secrets book, an indispensable guide on how to create your own show, travel the world, and get paid to do what you love.